Hello, athletic training students. Welcome to your online lecture for eye pathologies. I'm Dr. Cosby. Today, we're gonna to be discussing the anatomy of the eye and then um, different evaluative techniques to use um, when you're encountering a patient who has suffered from some type of eye injury. But before we even start there, I wanted to start with some interesting facts that I think will grab you and make you interested in this entire lecture. So uh, physicians estimate that up to 80% of perceptual input in sports comes from the eyes. So think about that. 80% of um, what we're thinking we're going to do in a sport in terms of movement, in terms of performance, really comes from the eyes. And that's because we know that sight is a part of the five senses. And it's one of the five senses that is most often utilized, unless we're, of course, sleeping, right? When our eyes are shut and aren't really providing any external feedback from the environment. But a 20,000 foot approach, right, would be to step back and then say, okay, in sports, does does a lack of vision or injury to the eye have the potential to impact the athlete's performance? And the answer is absolutely yes, right? We know, you all know that visual skills for all sports will include some sort of visual accuracy or acuity, some type of eye tracking or eye hand body coordination, right? It will require the use of uh, both peripheral vision, uh, central vision and depth of perception. And so um, the patient's overall ability to process and respond to visual stimuli really is important in, in the field of athletic training. It's important for us as athletic trainers to make sure that we really have good eye health among our student athletes. So this lecture will talk you through the anatomy so that you understand what you're looking at when you're assessing an eye injury and then walk you through the anatomy as well. All right, so the eye, um, with the exception of the anterior aspect, the part that we can actually touch with our fingers, it sits encased um, within this conical bony orbit, right? And you're seeing that bony orbit here on, on the slide that you're looking at. Um, that orbit, uh, believe it or not, is made up of seven different bones. So it isn't one bony structure, it's actually made up of seven different bones that come together um, to form this structure. And the major role of this structure is to protect it, protect the eye, but then also to stabilize the eye within the actual orbit itself, right? And so those seven bones are listed here. It's the frontal bone. That frontal bone is going to be responsible for making up the superior margin of the orbit. So we can see that here. We have the um, ethmoid bone and the lacrimal bone. Both of those bones are gonna come together to help support the most medial portion of the eye orbit. Uh, but then we have the maxilla, right, which is going to make up a major portion of the medial inferior orbit. And then we have the zygomatic bone, which is going to make up uh, the other half of that inferior margin, but then also come around to uh, support the lateral structure of the um, eye orbit itself. We have the sphenoid bone, which is going to be the most deep um, bone and is going to make up a lot of the posterior portion of the orbit, the part that the eyeball is actually going to rest on. But then it certainly helps reinforce or refine the medial aspect of the eye as well. And that frontal bone not only extends to the superior margin, but superior lateral portion as well. So we can see these seven bones really coming together, right? Um, the palatine bone, this very small bone that I missed, all of these bones are coming together um, to do what we call is support and protect um, to encase that eyeball within the orbit itself, right? So those are seven bones. Um, this is something that you do need to know for your board's exam. So it'll be important to know each of those seven bones, bone number one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Um, these bones, again, you can have injury to one bone that doesn't disrupt the entire orbit but most commonly we see injuries in the field of athletic training to the frontal bone or the superior portion of the eye orbit and then we oftentimes see injuries to the maxilla or the most inferior medial portion of the eye orbit so that is the bony anatomy very intricate made up of seven bones that are coming together to help support and protect the eyeball so now that you've had a great, you have a better understanding of the bony anatomy of the eye, let's dive deeper into the external anatomy. First stop is going to be with the eyelids, upper eyelid and then lower eyelid and eyelashes. Three major roles really, okay? So the first is gonna be protection. Second is going to be moisten. 
The third is exposure. So we're going to talk about overexposure to light and heat. Protection, I like to think of it this way. I like to think of it like the skin. Um, it is to protect us from external um, foreign bodies or objects, right? So the eyes will close to prevent an external or foreign body from invading us. To moisten, think about this. We blink every five seconds. And when we blink, we secrete um, water and we secrete oil. And this reduces the dry eye effect or it reduces our eyes um, or prevents our eyes from drying out. So oftentimes we'll have student athletes who wear maybe contacts or who have dry eyes who need to substitute because they are great at secreting the oil and water. And so they'll use eye drops, right? And then in terms of exposure, overexposure to light, let's think about this from a movie perspective. If we go to the movies for a few hours, um, essentially what you will see when you're in the movies is it's dark and then you go outside and what happens? There's light and your eyes will shut or they will close. And so um, that is a protective mechanism. There's too much light entering into the body to process. And so the eyes will automatically close. Another example of this would be um, for heat. So when we turn on the stove and if we turn it up too far, have you ever noticed that like your eyelashes get hot and you just close your eyes? So we're protecting our, our, our eyes from, from the heat. So those are the three main protection points for our eyelids and eyelashes. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit and erase everything that I wrote and then talk through anatomy. Um, the first anatomical structure I'm going to talk through is the sclera or what we know as the white of the eyes. So it's going to surround the entire eye. Um, and so you see this white anatomical structure here. It's thick, it's collagenous. And interestingly enough, if we come down here to the gross anatomy model, we will see that it is continuous with the optic nerve. And essentially what we also see is that it actually merges with the brain's um, fibrous lining. So not only is it continuous with the optic nerve posteriorly, it also becomes a part of the brain's fibrous lining, creating more stability of the eye within the actual orbit itself. So we have that sclera, which is the white lining here providing a lot of protection. The next anatomical structure that we'll talk about um, are the iris and the pupil, and we kind of will talk about them together. The pupil represents this black dark dot in the center of the iris, and then the iris represents the color of our, of our eye, right? And we know these structures pretty well, except for I want to give you a little bit more background on the two. Um, light travels through the pupil, and oftentimes the pupil is considered the gateway of light. Right, so we have the gateway of light here uh, because that is what light goes through. And so when light goes through the pupil, then other processes happen, which we'll talk through. But then um, surrounding the pupil right here is the iris. And the iris is a circular colored area of the eye and it controls the amount of light. So the iris controls the amount of light hitting amount of light kind of entering the eye. Um, the, the iris can either allow more light to enter the eye by dilating the pupil, or it can allow less light to enter the eye by constricting the pupil. Um, and so we can see how the iris plays a major role in um, constriction and dilation of the pupil because it actually contains the muscles, which will either tug on the pupil and cause it to dilate or become the muscles will become tight and cause the muscle to do what? The pupil to do what? To constrict, right? So it's those muscles within the iris that actually control dilation and constriction of the pupil. The pupil is just truly the gateway to, to allow light to enter into the eye itself. The next anatomical structure that I want to talk about is the cornea, which is here. So this is the cornea. The cornea, not to be confused with the sclera, right? The sclera, we've already seen, has its own pathway and sits, um, sits pretty much everywhere except on the actual iris or pupil. And so the cornea is going to do that. The cornea is going to be that anterior um, protectionary piece. So the cornea is a clear... Uh, sheath which is curved in nature and sits right on top of the iris and the pupil so you can see here this is actually going to be the pupil um, and then what we have where's your iris the iris is here so we have these two structures which are now being protected anterior by a clear thin sheath known as the cornea here 
So it's like the sclera on the outside of the eye, except for it's sitting on top of the two key anatomical structures, which allow um, or control the amount of light entering into the eye. The cornea, think about it this way, LASIK surgery, you've all heard of it. The cornea is what's going to be reshaped when LASIK surgery is actually taking place. So that cornea is extremely important because it allows light to enter in through the eye. And it's actually the first point of contact for light. So when we open our eyes, the first area that light enters in through is going to be the cornea, right? Then the cornea, the cornea, what the cornea will do is the cornea will then transfer light from the cornea to what? The gateway or the pupil, right? And what will control that? right? The amount of light entering the eye. It's going to be this structure here known as the iris. It's either going to allow that pupil to dilate and allow more light to enter or to constrict and only allow a small amount to enter. So I thought I'd bring those two together so you could see that. Okay, just deep to the pupil then is the next anatomical structure known as the lens. And the lens is important for two reasons. Um, so first and foremost, the lens is important because it changes shape. It changes its shape. And when it changes its shape, it allows the, um, the light to be focused on the retina or focuses the light on the retina. That's a better way to say it. It focuses the light on the retina. So the lens will change its shape, but it can do that only because we have these muscles which attach to it. So you can see them there, these muscles here. These are known as ciliary body muscles. These muscles either contract um, or relax. And so um, when they do that, essentially what the lens does is it becomes larger or more round-like in nature um, or thicker, or it becomes thinner like a pancake. When it's thicker, that means we can focus in on objects that are closer to us. And when it becomes thinner, we can focus on objects that are distant from us. But that all happens because the lens focuses the light on the retina. Now, as we move into the retina, um, the retina contains cells. And these cells are very sensitive to light. Anyone know what they are? Let's zoom out a little bit. If you said photoreceptors, you'd be correct. These are the cells that are going to be responsible for doing what? Transferring electrical signals, right? Um, or converting an image that we see, whether that's words, whether that's a person. So converting that image into an electrical signal, signal which are going to be carried to the nerve, by a nerve to the brain, right? So in, in this instance, the cells are known as photoreceptors. These photoreceptors we look at an image, those photoreceptors are responsible for converting that image into the electrical signal. We have two type, main types of photoreceptors. First are cones, and then second are going to be rods. Your cones, I think, see, which is color. They are really responsible for sharp, we'll say sharp vision, sharp or clear vision. Um, they are central vision. They are mostly responsible for allowing us to look straight ahead and interpret, and then I said color, didn't I? Okay, your rods on the opposite end of that are responsible for your night vision, so black and white. Um, and then they are also responsible for your peripheral vision, so side vision. So you can see how the two work together to help us interpret different parts of our environment. Rods are more numerous than cones, and they are much more sensitive to, to light, okay? So with that said, we have these two types of photoreceptors which take an image and convert it in a, into an electrical signal. But interestingly enough, each photoreceptor, each cone, each rod is linked to a nerve fiber, right? You can see kind of these nerve fibers. Um, each cone or each rod is linked to a nerve fiber. Then those nerve fibers um, for, from the photoreceptors, right? kind of they come together and are bundled to form what we call is the optic nerve, right? So it's the bundling of these photoreceptors that create the optic nerve. And we know that what? The optic nerve will then transfer image information to the brain to actually be interpreted. And so that's how it all, that's all it all happens. I made that sound like it was very simple, right? Okay. The retina contains a very important anatomical structure known as the macula, which is this sweet spot right here. Um, the macula is the most, what we call sensitive part of the retina. 
um, and it has millions of tightly packed photoreceptors, mostly cones, are going to be located here. And so what do you think that allows us to do? Yeah, it's sharp. Remember, we talked about sharp detail. So the macula in particular is really, really responsible for making sure our visual image is, is detailed, has high, kind of like high resolution, high definition. This is a high definition area. It's going to make that image very clear for us to interpret as that image or the, um, the signals travel to the brain to be interpreted. The optic disc itself, this part right here, this is the first, what we would call is the first part of the optic nerve and the very um, posterior part of the eye. So this is the optic disc and then it becomes the optic nerve where it then travels to the brain for interpretation. So that represents the anatomy of the eye. One thing we have left to talk about, and I kind of like this image a little bit better in a, because it has a little bit more detail, um, is that we have in the eye, the eye is really broken down into posterior cavities and anterior cavities. And so um, talking about them, I think is, is, is important. So the first cavity that we'll talk about is the posterior cavity, um, as the name also implies the vitreous chamber. The vitreous chamber contains vitreous humor and the vitreous humor, uh, not funny, ha ha ha. Um, the vitreous humor, believe it or not, is like a jelly-like uh, substance. Um, and that jelly-like substance is, is, is what kind of moistens the posterior aspect of, of the eye. It is, um, that posterior cavity it occur, is made, is, occurs from the lens, posterior aspect of the lens, all the way back. So this is what represents the posterior cavity itself. The anterior cavity, however, is a little bit more tricky and it's actually broken down into two components, the posterior chamber and the anterior chamber. So I'll talk about them separately, but let's talk about the anterior cavity as a whole. The anterior cavity is going to extend from the cornea all the way to the lens. So if we can think about it from there, that's the entire cavity and it is filled with an aqueous humor. Um, or a, a, a fluid that nourishes the in, an internal structures of the eye, right? So it's going to nourish the cornea, the iris, the pupil, and the lens. So its major job is to moisten and nourish those structures and keep them very healthy. And that's important because these structures are the structures that are responsible for bringing light into the eye so that it can actually be interpreted, right? So any lack of nourishment to these structures and the way that we process light or the amount of light we receive will be either lessened or increased and create problems for processing overall. But the anterior cavity is broken down into the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. So let's talk to the anterior chamber first. The anterior chamber is this chamber here, and it's going to represent the part of the chamber that extends from the cornea. So I'm gonna do it in a different color, from the cornea to the iris. Okay, so that's this. This would be the anterior chamber of the anterior cavity. And then if we could think about the posterior chamber of the anterior cavity, then what we would say is that extends from the iris, so let's find the iris again, to the back of the lid, lens. So we can see we have this posterior chamber, we have this anterior chamber, they all come together to create what we call is the anterior cavity of the eye. That posterior cavity, remember we already defined it, the back of the lens, right, all the way to the retina right and they have different they have different fluids remember the anterior cavity is going to have an aqueous fluid and then the posterior cavity is going to have a vitreous like fluid okay so let's review quickly because that's a lot i realize this and we're looking at a side view a dissected view of how light actually enters in so first things first, we have the cornea. So we open our eyes, light enters into the cornea. And from the cornea, that light is gonna enter into the pupil space. But light can't, the amount of light that enters into the pupil space is determined by this structure here known as the iris, right? That iris is either gonna cause a dilation or a constriction of the pupil. It's either gonna allow more light to enter or less light to enter essentially. And so what happens then is after we determine the amount of light that's allowed to enter into the gateway or the pupil, that light then enters into the lens, right? And that lens, remember we said it can change its shape. It can either get really thick 
spray and if it gets thick it allows us to see objects that are close to us and if it gets flat or pancake like um, then we know that we can uh, see objects that are further away in addition to that the lens will allow the light to focus on the retina and the retina contains photoreceptors right and those photoreceptors are our cones and our rods and each of these cones and rods all have nerves they all come together to form one specific nerve known as the optic nerve. And that optic nerve is responsible for doing what? Um, taking the converted images that our photoreceptors convert, all right? And transferring that information to the brain to be interpreted. Now that disc, remember that lens can be transformed or reshaped with these muscles right here. So the ciliary muscle and the ciliary process, those muscles are responsible for allowing that disc to get thick or to become small. We have the anterior chamber, we have the posterior chamber. Remember that anterior chamber is going to um, occur from the cornea, right? Do you remember that? To the, to the lens. And then we have the back of the lens all the way to the retina for the posterior chamber. That posterior chamber is filled with vitreous humor. The anterior chamber is filled with aqueous humor. So we are good to go on external structure, internal anatomy of the eye. For review very quickly, this is a beautiful image. We're just gonna trace light as it enters. So remember, the first stopping point for light is here. We open our eyes, Eyes enter, light enters the eye through the cornea. That light is then transferred to what? The pupil. Remember, we said in the, the previous slides that um, the pupil vasoconstricts or dilates based on what? Do you remember? The iris and the muscles in in the iris. So those muscles will either allow more light to enter through dilation or less light to enter through constriction. Either way, that light then moves from the pupil into the lens. And in the lens, a few things happen. First thing is um, the light is allowed to be focused in the retina, but then also the lens will change its shape, right? The changing of the shape of the lens is controlled by the ciliary muscles here and here. These muscles either kind of stretch and flatten out the disc or the lens, allowing us to see objects that are further from us, or maybe they contract and cause the disc to come become thicker to allow us to see objects that are close to us, um, i.e. reading a computer screen, for example. But back to what the lens also does once the light hits it, is it, remember, focuses light on the retina, and the retina is important because it, it has um, our, what? Our photoreceptors, right? And our photoreceptors are the rods and the cones, right? Our rods are black and white, a peripheral vision, our cone color, clarity, um, and central vision, right? But these rods and cones, more importantly, at least the photoreceptors, what is their major role? To convert the image into an electrical signal, right? They convert that image into an electrical signal. We know that those rods and cones become one nerve known as the optic nerve. That nerve will um, take that converted image and that electrical signal to the brain where it's interpreted as the image or the word that we're reading. If you guys aren't stoked about this information, then I don't know what else to say. There are uh, two cavities within the eye that we talked about, the anterior cavity, right? So the anterior cavity right here, and then we have the posterior cavity, which would be right here. Um, draw that anterior cavity a little bit better. So the anterior cavity. That anterior cavity, if we recall, was kind of broken up into two different segments, the anterior segment and then the posterior segment. That anterior segment was gonna extend from the cornea, which is here, all the way to the iris. So the cornea to the iris would be the anterior, we'll call it, segment. And then the posterior segment is going to extend from the iris to the lens. So we have this entire anterior cavity, which is filled with aqueous humor. We have that posterior um, cavity or segment, which moves from the lens to the to the retina and is comprised of vitreous humor.
So I hope that's helpful as we progress in this lecture and you have a better understanding of the eye in general. So more specifically, we're going to focus in on the optic nerve. Um, the optic nerve, as you know, is responsible for relaying messages from your eyes to your brain um, to create visual images, right? And we talked about how light enters or how images enter in through the eye, how they're transformed in the retina, how we looked at photoreceptors, the rods and the cones, and how those um, then kind of convert images into electrical impulses, which get traveled Get, which travel through the optic nerve to the brain, right? And so now what we're doing is kind of dissecting that a little bit. The optic nerve in particular, which is cranial nerve number two, um, is going to be responsible for relaying those messages from your eyes to the brain to create visual images, right? Millions of nerve fibers make up um, each optic nerve. And so damage to the optic nerve can lead to vision loss in one um, and or both eyes depending on. So the optic nerve is a major nerve when we think about uh, its role in vision, how many nerves make make up or comprise of the optic nerve. Um, so here's what we think about when we think about the optic nerve. The optic nerve is critical to your vision. Um, it's a, an extension of the central nervous system, which includes the brain and the spine, right? It's going to transmit electrical impulses from your eyes to your brain, and then your brain is going to process this sensory information so that you can see it, right? So it can create the image or the word on the screen or on the book, etc. right? We know that we have 12 cranial nerves, which we'll dissect throughout this class. But the first cranial nerve that we're going to talk about is optic nerve, which is cranial nerve number two. Um, the optic nerve, if we were to go back a slide, remember we talked about that kind of optic disc. Um, and so I'll circle it here on this image here. This is the optic disc. This is where the optic nerve actually starts, where the group of cells kind of come together um, in the back of your eye. And then it travels to what we call is the optic canal and and enters into the skull and so i'm going to come back to this slide because once it enters into the skull um, the optic nerve from the right and the left are going to cross pathways and you'll see that here in this image where they're crossing pathways so the optic nerve will cross pathways from the right and the left so see things are coming here in here from the eyes and then essentially what you'll have is one side crossing over here, the other side crossing over here, and that crossing point is known as the optic chiasma. And so what is the optic chiasma? The optic chiasma is a part of the brain where the optic nerves cross. And so there, this is where you, when you think of what is the most important part in the visual pathway, it's actually the optic chiasma. It's going to be located kind of um, at the at the base of the brain, just inferior to the hypothalamus. So it's extremely important in terms of injury to this area, the stakes that are involved. But in general, when we think about visual pathways, when we think about how things happen, right light enters the eye through the cornea it goes through um, the pupil then it remember through the lens is is refocused on the retina from the retina the retina then carries that image or that light to the optic nerve that optic nerve will then um, transfer that signal through the optic chiasma which i just talked about through the optic track where then it's interpreted by the visual cortex. And the visual cortex is what allows us to see that actual image. So that optic nerve is extremely important. Any paralysis to the optic nerve, and then we have visual disturbances within the actual pathway itself. So I truly do think that this should be a review. So I'm not gonna spend a whole bunch of time here because I kind of already dissected each of these anatomical structures, but this is the iris. The iris is the color of the eye. And as you guys can see from this beautiful image, you can kind of see the, the muscles which live or house within the actual iris. And it's those muscles that will constrict or dilate the pupil um, and allow more light to come in or allow less light to enter that, right? In this white anatomical structure, we know as the sclera, right? And that sclera is a collagenous structure. It's very thick. And remember that sclera is here and it's here and it's going to travel um, and kind of become one with the optic nerve and then essentially will become a part of, what did we say? Anybody remember? <laughs> 
the brain's lining, right? So we have to keep that in mind. But the iris, its major role really is to house the muscles that are responsible for allowing the pupil to dilate and constrict. So it's a major important anatomical structure in determining the amount of light that enters or doesn't enter into the, into the eye to be interpreted as a signal eventually. The one new anatomical structure that I wasn't able to talk about in the actual eye anatomy slide was the conjunctiva because you can't see it in the images that I had in the earlier slides, but you can see it here. The conjunctiva is a thin, very thin mucous membrane, and it's going to um, not only line the inside of the eyelids here, what it's also going to do is it's going to line the sclera or the white part of the eye. And so it is highly vascularized with many micro vesicles. Um, and so making it um, at high risk for injury because it has so many different blood vessels um, assigned to it. But you can see it here, that mucous membrane lines both the upper um, inner eyelid and the lower inner eyelid, but then will also slip and, and cover the actual sclera itself. So that's the conjunctiva and we'll talk about it more when we get into the pathology section. The cornea we talked about, right? We discussed it's gonna lay over the pupil and the iris. Um, it's a very transparent covering of the eye. And remember, its major role is to focus light rays entering to the eye and then to transfer the light from the cornea to the actual pupil. But what I discussed in the earlier slide, and you can see here, is it is the structure anatomically that most people um, will have reshaped. Um, when they have the LASIK procedure. So that is exactly what you see being reshaped. It's a very thin structure, so that's why they have to use a LASIK procedure to do that, right? So there are um, muscles that drive eye movement, right? So we have six muscles and then we have three cranial nerves that really drive the movement, the actual movement of, of the eye. And we're gonna talk through each of these kind of independently, at least the six muscles. But as we name them here on this particular slide, since we're here, um, we have what we call is the superior rectus. We have the inferior rectus. We have the medial rectus, lateral rectus, and then we have what are called the oblique muscles. So superior oblique and inferior oblique. I promise you, we will uh, go through each of these independently. One of the things that I want you to see as it relates to each of these muscles is kind of where they attach because that will help understand their angle of, of pull essentially. So we can see that the medial rectus is gonna attach to the medial side of the eye and therefore drag or pull the eye in a medial direction or towards the nose. We can see that that inferior rectus is gonna have an attachment to the inferior aspect of the eye, therefore pulling the eye in a downward or inferior uh, motion. And then we can see the superior rectus has a superior attachment and will pull the eye in a superior direction and not image on, um, not pictured in this particular image, but if we could, we'd put a lateral rectus right here and it would drag the eye into a lateral direction. So we can see we have sagittal plane movers in the inferior and superior rectus. We have, I guess, um, lateral medial movers in the lateral and um, medial rectus. And then we have translatory um, muscles in the superior and inferior oblique. And we're gonna talk about their role because their name does not imply exactly what they do. Each of these muscles, however, are innervated by a few cranial nerves. So we talked about the role of the optic nerve, which is cranial nerve number two, and its role in um, delivering um, images or light um, transforming those, uh, transferring those to the brain, particularly the visual cortex, where they can then be converted into an image that we actually see. The cranial nerves um, that supply the six muscles that I just alluded to in this particular slide are going to be the number three, the oculomotor nerve, which will supply or drive motor con contribution to the medial, superior, and inferior rec rectus muscles and the inferior oblique. You have the uh, trochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve number number four, which will um, drive motion to the superior oblique. And then you have cranial ner nerve number six, which would drive motion of the um, lateral rectus. So we can see that all of the muscles are at least included in the ways that they're innervated. Each of these nerves, as I said, three, 
four and six will all drive or be responsible for driving motor contribution, which means they are responsible for supplying input and allowing those muscles to contract to pull the eye in a certain or specific direction. And this is an amazing image of just how um, our optic, our oculomotor, and our trochlear nerves will kind of innervate each of the, the respective muscles. So this is the ocular motor nerve here. You can see that so cranial nerve number number three. And we can see how it comes down and has innervation into the superior rectus muscle, right? Um, we can also see that it has an innervation into the levator pap popularae, which is the uh, muscle that's responsible for um, pulling the upper eyelid up. And then in addition to that, we can see how it comes down. Everybody seeing that there, how it will come down and have um, an insertion into the inferior oblique muscle and then the inferior rectus muscle. So we can see how it kind of branches out um, and will supply different rectus muscles or oblique muscles um, to drive motion. So this is just a very specific kind of diagram of each of the nerve innervations. But if we go back, the big thing, the big key thing to know is which nerve is going to innervate which muscle. Because if we have paralysis to one of these nerves, right, then we know that the patient most likely won't be able to move their eye in a specific direction. So knowing the innervation of the, the muscles will become extremely important as we assess um, eye pathologies and eye abnormalities. So let's talk a little bit about what the muscles actually do. I alluded to it quickly, but I wanted to spend a little bit more time here on this particular slide. Some of these are very intuitive. The rectus muscles in particular are very intuitive in what they do. Their name or the direction describes the direction in which they move the eye. So the lateral rectus is going to move the eye laterally. The medial rectus, rectus is going to move the eye medially. That superior rectus is going to move the eye superior and that inferior rectus is going to move the eye inferior, right? Those are all intuitive to me. When we get to the obliques, however, something different happens. The angle of a pull changes for the attachment sites for these particular muscles. So the inferior oblique is actually going to move the eye up and lateral. So in other words, if we can see that inferior oblique, its angle of pull, you see it here, it's when it contracts, moves the eye up and out, okay? Similarly, the superior oblique is going to do something a little bit different. It's going to move the eye down. Um, so it's gonna move the eye down and out or abducted, right? So think about it this way. Both eyes move the eye out or laterally, but the inferior oblique, because of its angle of pull, is going to move the eye up. The superior oblique, because of its angle of pull, is going to move the eye down. So we have to think about that when we're actually testing the eyes, right? If we have the eye move inward, then we know that's medial rectus, which is supplied by oc the oculomotor nerve, right? If we have we, the eye move down, then we know that's inferior rectus, right? And we know that's supplied by the oculomotor nerve. You guys can see this pretty easily now, right? We have the eye move up, then we know that's superior rectus, again, supplied by cranial nerve number three. That inferior oblique, remember what we said, it's going to move the eye in an upward fashion and out. So as we think about it, it's still going to be supplied by cranial nerve number three, the oculomotor nerve here. Um, now the lateral rectus on the opposite end of that is going to move the eye, which direction, you guys? Good, it's gonna move the eye laterally there and is innervated by the abducens, right? And then you have the superior oblique. Remember, the superior oblique is gonna move that eye kind of down and lateral. And so it's also going to have its own innervations. We said abducens here, this is going to be the trochlear nerve. So we can see how each muscle has its distinct um, attachment sites and it's important and it's key to know that the recti muscles will do exactly what they say. So if it says superior rectus, it's moving the eye superior. The obliques, on the other hand, um, are move the eye at an, an oblique angle. And you have to think about it from a directionality or an angle of pull. Look at this superior oblique, right? It's obviously going to move the eye in a lateral direction, but it's actually going to tuck the eye or move the eye in a downward fashion. 
So sometimes students struggle through that because it's counterintuitive. If they think superior, they automatically think the eye is going to move superior, but it moves opposite of that. Please make sure you understand the innervations in the movements because as we move through patterns of eye movement, you will need to know if an eye isn't tracking or moving in a different direction, why the eye isn't doing what it's expected to do in clinical practice. All right, so now we move on to um, patient evaluation and really um, how do we assess a patient who walks into the clinic with a eye pathology. And so any, you already know this, any uh, assessment of a patient is always going to start with the HIPS process. So we're, we'll start with the history and we'll work our way through. So when we think about past medical history, there are key questions that we want to ask specific patients as they come in. The first one is you want to ask the patient about any past or prior history having to deal with visual acuity, their inability to see things clearly. The other thing that we want to do is ask them, do they wear glasses? Um, have they had LASIK surgery, for example, or um, do they wear contacts? These are all important as you think through um, participating in sport and whether or not their vision needs to be corrected. And if so, for what reasons do they actually need to have a correction, right? Do they have the inability to see far? Do they have the inability to see close? What are the reasons that they're actually wearing glasses? The next thing that we want to ask about is this, this pathology um, right here, which is nystagmus, which is an involuntary shaking of the eyes, um, which can oftentimes be associated with a previous head injury, for example, or could be associated with patients who suffer from vertigo or dizziness um, or syncope. So you, we, will, uh, we will learn how to assess nystagmus, but we do that in our assessment of eye motion. We also want to know if they've ever had any previous history of um, head injuries. So not just eye injuries, but head injuries, and then obviously eye injuries as well. And then whether or not they have pre-existing health conditions. So an example of that might be diabetes, which has does impact the visual system. Glaucoma would be a another example of, of that. Eye clouding would be another example. So we want to really figure out the patient's past medical history. In general, we also want to ask the patient about um, familial eye history, right? We know that diabetes most often can be congenital along with uh, glaucoma, right? Um, so we want to make sure that we are doing our due diligence when we meet with the patient who's suffering from an eye pathology. Now, as we move into the, the present part of this, right, um, we really want to be focused in on the location and the, the description of the symptoms that the patient is presenting in front of us, right? One of the common signs and symptoms after an eye pathology is photophobia um, or the inability to receive a lot of eye through a lot of light through the eyes or an intolerance to light right the example of that would be sitting in that dark movie theater and then moving outside to that bright light right remember we talked about that overexposure to light so something's going on there if a patient has photophobia which anatomical structure do you think they may have a dysfunction of did you say the iris, right? Because that's going to help control the amount of light or it could be the pupil, right? The amount of light entering into the pupil to be interpreted. The other thing that we might see uh, people report a lot of times is they feel like there's something in their eye, but when they look in the mirror, for example, they can't see anything. So if they say there's something in their eye, most often the cause is going to be a foreign body. That's pretty obvious or you're going to ask about contacts or allergies. A lot of times allergies will dry the eye and lessen its ability to do what? To, to blink and then to cause moisten, to, oil, to have oil and water. And so people with allergies tend to have or feel like something's in their eye because they tend to have suffer from dry eye. And then you have um, the something in your eye where there's nothing present. And that can be a, a telltale sign of what we call is a corneal abrasion or a scratching of the cornea. If we were to go to go back a few slides, what does the cornea do or where does it live? Great. Hopefully you said it sits on the iris, right? It sits anterior to the iris and the pupil. Its major role is to protect those two anatomical structures. So if you have an abrasion, oftentimes you'll feel like something's in the eye, but it's not really there. And then we have um, itchiness, a lot of... Um, rubbing of the eye or you feel like you want to want to scratch it and so um oftentimes when there's an itching of the eye 
it's usually associated with some type of edema within the eye, um, edema of the conjunctiva. Remember, it's that mucous membrane lining the upper um, and lower eyelid, um, or it could be some type of viral or even bacterial allergic reaction that the patient has had. But the biggest historical question that you want to ask is the, the mechanism of injury, right? How did it actually happen? What did the object actually look like? Elastic, uh, elastic objects versus plastic objects, right? Typically, um, plastic objects have a little bit um, um, less give, and so they tend to do more damage to the to the orbit. Whereas your um, your elastic objects tend to give a little bit more and might have cause more damage to the actual eye itself. So knowing the mechanism of injury is going to be extremely important. The other thing that we have to consider with the eye is chemical injury. Um, so we want to we want to make sure that there wasn't any exposure to any chemical. And if, it, if there was, then we may have to uh, flush that dirt in the eye with softball, baseball, soccer, even turf, for example. So this would be these would be the his historical questions that we're going to ask a patient who has an eye pathology. And then last but definitely not least, one of the things you have to understand is that there's certain sports that really have a high risk for eye injuries. Um, one of those is racket sports. And so we can kind of think about this from um, a high velocity st a standpoint. Tennis, for example, right? If I have a patient serving, um, if I have a opponent serving the tennis ball at a high rate and I miss the forehand or backhand, that ball is going to go directly into my eye orbit if they're aiming it relatively well. Things that are more intuitive would be boxing and basketball, where you can see in this image down here, there's a finger going into the eye with boxing direct blow to the eye orbit. And then golf, um, not the golfer, but mainly those, the spectators where the golf ball might actually go into the eye. So we'll see a lot of catastrophic eye injuries with the sports listed above. But the key thing here is that the majority of eye injuries that we will see can be prevented through appropriate eye um, protective equipment. The reality is most people won't want to play these sports with some type of goggles, but where we can protect those that are high risk for eye injuries, we will. Sports like lacrosse would be an example. Uh, rugby would be another example where patients might wear goggles to be protective in nature. All right, we've moved through history, which is pretty quick and simple, I think, and should be relatively um, quick in the way that we do that because there aren't very many historical questions that you're going to be asking your patient. Most of the time we're going to be focused in on if we go back on the this part, right? History of the present condition. And now as we move into inspection, one thing that we have to consider about the eye is this, because all but the most anterior portion of the eye is hidden from view, meaning the anterior part we can see, but the posterior structure of the eye is hidden by the eye orbit, which is intended to protect it. We have to be very, very careful because trauma to the eye, um, the external eye may mask an underlying pathology, the internal pathology that may be taking place, right? So I'll give an example, a relatively normal outward appearance of an eye does not mean that the internal portion of the eye is okay. So as you do your assessment and inspection of the patient, we have to make sure that not only do we look at the external features, but that we test the internal um, features or anatomical structures as well. And that's gonna include, remember those muscles that I just talked about, making sure that the eye moves well, making sure we're testing the optic nerve and whether or not it's allowing us to convert images, um, things into images that are actually real and that we actually see. So a normal um, external eye may still have internal damage. That's huge for you all to consider. When we think about immediate referral findings, there's a huge table on this, but some of the ones that are really important, if a patient presents to you with photophobia, that's automatic referral most often, especially if there was trauma. This means they, they can't tolerate light. They have to close their eyes. Light is bothering them, irrespective of a head injury, obviously, right? So tolerance to light, if that's impacted. Diplopia, right? Does anyone know what that means? That means double vision. So if the patient has double vision, then we are referring out for some sort of... Um, reassessment. Um, another one would be if a patient has what we call is a hyphema, 
or blood in the anterior chamber of the eye, then we're referring out because that can actually impact um, that can impact healing and the optic nerve and the optic disc. If they have a limitation in range of motion of the eye, then we're referring out. And then abnormal, we'll say abnormal um, pupil reaction, right? So these are the main key takeaways, but there certainly are more listed on your table in your textbook. So next step is going to be inspection of the pre or orbital area and globe. So that's gonna be you essentially looking at everything on the external portion of the eye, right? The superior orbit, the medial eye orbit, the lateral, and then the inferior eye orbit. Um, a simple, simple, periorbital hematoma or a black eye for better words a black eye right which is a which is a periorbital hematoma um, a black eye um, is common with blunt injuries right so blunt trauma injuries a blow to the eye a bat to the eye you bump your eye on something right and typically doesn't have any major consequence it's going to be abnormal in appearance it might be red black and blue and have ecchymosis but keep in mind that um, external trauma through the eyelid or the orbit may still indicate trauma to the actual eye itself. So we still have to do, even though we see the discoloration, we can assume there's an external injury, but we still have to rule out internal eye injury as well. Remember that. That's going to be the key, key theme throughout the rest of the lecture, most likely. The next thing that we want to assess for is any gross deformity, right? So we want to look for bony deformity of the eye orbit. Um, there is very rare, but it can indicate a very significant condition, which would require kind of immediate referral and immediate immediate medical intervention. Um, so this a sign of this could be like loose skin surrounding the eye or the eyelid. It could be lacerations that you observe around the eye, right? Um, lacerations that you observe around the eye. So what we want to do is inspect for those. We want to look for gross bony deformities. One way to look for gross bony deformities is what what will we fill? Some type of like step off deformity, for example, um, or piano key sign. You guys remember that from last semester, I hope. Um, so we want to palpate that eye orbit. And remember that eye orbit is made up of sev seven bones. And so we want to really palpate them um, in each of those different areas to make sure we're being specific about the bones that we're actually um, uh, palpating. Lacerations, believe it or not, are most often a common secondary injury to the trauma, right? So trauma happens and then as a result of the blow, then we have a laceration. And so the question becomes, um, do we refer lacerations out? What do we do exactly? And we'll talk through what we do, but most often if it's in the face and it can be repaired or sutured or glued, then we refer out because we want to keep the face as aesthetically nice as we possibly can. The next uh, thing that we're going to assess are going to be the eyelids, right? So remember the eyelids are important because they serve three different functions, right? They're going to moisten, so we have to be able to blink. They're going to um, reduce the exposure to extra light, so they still need to be able to close. And they're going to protect us from our external foreign pathogens that are trying to invade the eye. So if our eyelids are dysfunctioning, if they're swollen, if they're ecumotic, for example, then the ability to open and close the eyelid is lessened. And so either it stays closed and we have increase in moisture, which leads to what? Increase in um, the risk for infection, right? So we don't want it to stay closed for too long. Or if it can't open and close, then we have decreased moisture because what? We can't bring in H2O and oil. So we want to find the homeostatic area wherever we can. Um, with with lacerations to the actual eyelids, the other thing that we worry about most often with these lacerations is whether or not they actually need to be repaired, whether or not um, we'll risk the, the, it risk the, increase the risk for infection. And then we can have what is called a sty. So we'll talk about that in class and talk about maybe how many people have actually had a sty, but a sty is an infection of a ciliary gland um, or a sebaceous gland. So a sweat gland or a gland that's responsible for doing what? Secreting, right? So styes most often are as a result of 
too much maybe secretion of H2O and oil, right? Okay, and then for the cornea, um, since the cornea is normally like really crystal clear, um, any discoloration indicates uh, trauma, right? So anytime we have cloudiness or any other discoloration, um, we're really concerned about whether or not we're gonna increase pressure in the eye. And so that's an immediate referral. And oftentimes I've only seen this once in my clinical career where they'll actually have to go in and drain um, the pressure from the eye. So be careful there. Uh, the other pathology that you can encounter is a hyphema, which is going to be a collection, I think I said this already, a collection of blood in the anterior um, segment of the eye. So it's in that anterior component. Remember, we have that aqueous humor, which is meant to kind of create moist, moisture to the anterior structures of the eye. So when the blood when the blood starts to fill the eye, which is most often caused by like a rupturing of some sort of blood vessel, when the blood's allowed to fill the anterior chamber of the eye, the patient can actually lose lose vision. So we have to be very careful and inspect that. And of course, we're doing this with our eyes, right? Everything we do, everything we're looking for is going to be us looking at the patient with our eyes and getting pretty close. We'll continue on the inspection of the globe. The, the conjunctiva is mostly a clear, transparent covering, right? Remember, it's that kind of mucous membrane. Um, we can kind of see the conjunctiva on the upper and lower eyelids. What we may need to do is actually pull those eyelids up and or down to actually view them. Um, but to view the inferior portion of the conjunctiva, um, you're just gently gonna pull down the eyelid as the patient looks upward and you're just gonna look and see, is it clear like it's supposed to be? Is it not clear? Oftentimes we can have what is called a subconjunctival hematoma. And you can kind of see that in this image here where you can see like the blood vessels are just transfused. Um, this is most often caused in, by some other condition right in the eye that is just starting to man itself, manifest itself within the conjunctiva. You can also have what's called conjunctivitis, which is an inflammation of the conjunctiva or AKA red eye. And we'll get to that. And next, what we want to do is look at the sclera. Um, you, what you can see oftentimes with the sclera, what we see in the eye is you'll have some type of uh, the appearance of a black object on the sclera. Um, if you see that, like a black object on the on the sclera, then you want to refer out right away. Most often that's a sign that the sclera has been compromised or that there's a wound and so it will be bulging outward. And so then we just want to refer out. You can have a condition called iritis, which is inflammation of the iris. And so oftentimes this is secondary to some type of um, conjunctival uh, irritation. So it could most likely be that you have some type of some conjunctival hematoma, hematoma that then starts to drain into the iris causing iritis or inflammation of the iris, right? Now, pupil shape and size is going to be extremely important when we're assessing the eye. Um, we always want to make sure we're looking at whether or not pu pupils per are equal, um, round, and reactive to light. And so one of the biggest concerns is going to be this this right here, which is called anascoria. Um, does anybody know what anascoria is? It's when you look at a patient's eyes side by side and you have unequal pupil sizes. And most often that may be benign, but it can also be secondary to uh, head trauma. So if the patient has had a history of head injury, they're coming into you and they have anascoria, the equal unequal pupil sizes, then that's an immediate referral to, guess what, the ER. The other thing that we want to look for is what we call is a teardrop pupil. Again, this falls under teardrop shape and size. A teardrop pupil, when we think about that, what's it mean? You have a little bit of a, a tear um, or some type of laceration in, in the cornea. And so it causes like a little bit of a tearing down of the pupil itself. So the pupil won't be round. It'll look, I don't know, like a little bit of a triangle on the inferior edge of that pupil. Or you can have what we call is an actual ruptured globe. So we want to make sure that as we inspect, we want to make sure that we're looking at all of the anatomical structures. Do they look like they're actually supposed to look based on what I know? 
Do the pupils, are they equal? Are they active and reactive to light? Or is there one shape? Or are they fully blown? Are they fully dilated? Are they fully constricted? Those are all going to give us key signs and symptoms regarding pathology to the actual eye itself. Onward to palpation. This will be our first lab, and I'm excited to announce that there really aren't that many structures that we're actually going to be palpating for the eye lab. And so the bony structures are going to be the uh, orbital margin, which we already talked about. So the superior orbit, orbit the inferior orbit, the medial orbit, and then the, the lateral orbit. Um, and so, it, so we, we discussed that the orbital margin will do the frontal bone. Right, which will make up the superior margin of the orbit. We'll do the nasal bone, which will make up the medial kind of portion. We'll do the zygomatic bones, which will make up the lateral portion, right? And then any um, soft tissue surrounding that area, uh, but mainly the eyelid and then the skin surrounding the eye. So it's a pretty straightforward lab in terms of palpation. Other things that we have to consider in an eye eval, since there aren't that many palpations and there aren't that many special tests, really truly has to do with um, the eye examination of a patient, right? So we're going to assess physical acuity, visual fields. We'll look at um, extraocular movements or muscle movements, gross external examination, and then um, a, a, a thalmoscomic um, examination, which we'll do in lab. So let's talk visual acuity first. Um, we're going to use a Snellen chart to do that, and we have to make sure that that Snellen chart is placed at 20 feet away from the patient, right? And we'll think we do this in lab, um, but you're going to have the patient read um, at least half of each line. You will know right away whether or not that patient is going to read the line or not. Traditionally, we start at line 8, which is considered 2020. And what does that mean? Tw patient has 2020. Um, vision. The patient's ability to read at 20 feet what a normal person could read at 20 feet. This is normal vision called emetropia. You need to know that for exam. And so can a patient read at 20 feet what any normal person or normal eye could read at 20 feet? If so, then they are normal. We don't have to test any further, right? Well, what does 2040 mean or 2050? A patient's ability to read at 40 feet what a normal person could read at 20. So they really have a great vision. Now, of course, we have um, two different types of eye abnormalities, and typically these are diagnosed um, at when you go in for your eye checkup, but you have myopia and hyperopia. So uh, myopia represents nearsightedness. And if you think about the retina and how the lens will focus perfectly focus the light on the ret retina. But when we have a lens abnormality, the light rays are focused in front of the retina instead of on the retina itself. And so that creates an inability to see very far. Does that make sense? So nearsighted individuals, their light focuses in front of the retina, hence the near part. And so they have an inability to see things that are very far. Another way to say that is the lens doesn't get as far as it normally does, making it very challenging for them to see um, very far, if that makes sense too. Hyperopia or farsightedness, um, the light rays, instead of being focused directly on the retina, or they get focused behind the retina, so think far, further past the retina, these individuals have an inability to see things close, right? So we can think that, okay, maybe the lens is more flat and is, isn't getting as round or as thick. And so as a result, we have the inability to focus on things in, in front of us. So those are the two different eye conditions that you have to know and own. And then also this is how you would kind of diagnose your patient moving forward. So when we test our patient, we're going to be using um, for extraocular movements or for muscle movements, we're going to be using what we call as an H kind of pattern as we do this. You're essentially going to ask that patient to look straight ahead and you're just going to ask the patient to follow you through what we call are the six cardinal planes and typically we make an H and a star pattern. So let's think through this. If we want to test inferior rectus, right, we're going to have the patient look down. However, if we want to assess inferior oblique, remember we're going to have that patient look up and out. That would be one. If we want to assess superior rectus, we want to have the patient look up, lateral rectus out, medial rectus in. Everybody see that? And then superior oblique. Does anybody remember? It's going to be down and out, right? And so the obliques will do something a tad bit different. But we can see the pattern. You're going to take your hand, your finger, and just move it in the star pattern. What we certainly could do in H, right? So the patient looks up, looks down, looks out, looks in, looks up, looks down. So we can either do an H pattern or a star pattern, um, but each of these patterns would be assessing 
each of the six muscles of the eye and that's how we can assess which muscles might be involved or which muscles may not be working well post-traumatic injury. So pathologies of the eye can really be grouped into kind of three major categories. The first category is going to be infections, trauma, and then other. And so we'll kind of break down each of these um, groupings in their own slides. But these are the three kind of categories that the pathologies can be broken down into. Ultimately, what we really want to think about is when do we refer? Like if we're really asking that question clinically, the question just becomes when do we refer? So this list is here and is really all inclusive and I've kind of gone through some of them, but anytime they lose some or part of their visual field, if they have double vision diplopia, if they have sensitivity to light or can't handle light photophobia, if they have blood in the anterior chamber called hyphema we're referring out if there's a uh, foreign object embedded in the eye if you have an iris um, irregularity so remember we talked about um, the tear dropped shaped maybe pupil or um, an iris that's larger an actual iris that's larger than another typically non-congenital not congenital um, if you have air escaping from the eyelid or pain when blowing the nose, that's going to indicate some type of fracture. Um, and a scoria, um, which is unequal pupil size, we're concerned about head injury. And then restricted eye movement. So if we do an eye movement assessment and the patient can't move in a certain direction, we want to we want to refer out. So let's talk through the infections first. The first type of infection is conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis, as you all know this, is what? Okay, yes, it's pink eye, the dreaded, what we would call pink eye, right? So we're going to call this pink eye, even though for your test, you need to know it as conjunctivitis. It can be caused by um, virus, it can be caused by bacteria, or it can be sometimes just brought on by allergies. Remember, it, with allergies, some oftentimes there is a decrease in um moisturation and so as a result it can irritate the conjunctiva and cause a conjunctivitis right so we have this inflammation of the conjunctiva which remember the major role of the conjunctiva is to do what to provide protection to the overall eye to help moisten the eye right um, overall so as we dive deeper you can have a viral or a bacterial infection um, known as pink eye the pain is going to be mild. It's really not pain, right? It might be like a scratching feeling. Um, the vision in terms of what will happen, the patient may re um, report uh, mild blurring due to discharge, right? So we, we can see like, okay, what's the difference between a viral um, and a bacterial infection? Viral, believe it or not, is the most common form of conjunctivitis that you, you will see. So it's most common. Um, this type of pink eye is the most contagious. So when we think about which of these is most contagious, it is the viral form. It's the one that gets spread most often in elementary schools or among kids. So there is typically burning red eye and a watery discharge, but the major differential diagnosis is the type of discharge. The discharge is usually typically clear with viral, whereas, um, or there you go, watery with viral, and then with bacterial, it typically has some form of discoloration. It's going to be thicker or what we call mucoid or thicker. Um, and it's also very contagious, but it, it, what we see most often is that it can be treated oftentimes with other drugs because it most often occurs secondary to some ter sort of illness. So like um, strep throat would be an example of that. The great thing about these two types is that... Um, most often they are self curable for the most part, unless of course, what did I just say? They are associated with some other pathology. The pupil, however, is not impacted. So the pupil and the cornea are not impacted. The cornea should be clear, should not be cloudy. If it is, then we're referring out. I do wanna mention allergic conjunctivitis, which is a type of pink eye that it stems from an allergic reaction to a pollen or animals or cigarette smoke, etc. This one isn't contagious, which is why we don't mention it very often in the medical community, just as a result of having an allergic reaction. But the two that we just mentioned, viral and bacterial, are extremely um, contagious. Differentials, whether or not you need to refer out if it's viral versus bacterial, is the coloration of the discharge, right? It'll be clear with that viral infection. Moving forward in terms of treatment, um, bacterial-wise, it's antibiotic drops. Um, 
typically sometimes it will cause more pain though those drops so sometimes you try to let it play its course out and just use a warm compress and again the viral is more common um, typically no discharge and often associated with some type of upper respiratory tract infection but there's not much to do you're going to keep your kids home for about 48 to 72 hours um, have them wash their hands sanitize as much as is possible what we see uh, most often with we'll go back to bacterial um, is that the may um, the optometrist may prescribe some sort of anti-inflammatory medication drops um, or antihistamine if it's viral just in in case to reduce the signs and symptoms but oftentimes physicians really try to let them play their course so with a sty, as the slide is imp implying, it, there's typically some type of infection of the oil gland um, of the eyelid uh, or the eyelash follicles. Um, and that's most often due to an inability to drain. So there's this clogging that happens and then you develop some type of bump on the upper and or lower eyelid. And most often they're pretty harmless and they typically will, will go away. But what you will see is exactly what you see here in this image, a redness in the area of the sty, whether that's in the upper eyelid or the, the lower eyelid, tenderness to palpation in the area, right? Think of it as like a pimple almost in pain. Um, common to have a little bit of yellowish pus in the area, but do not pop it. The recommendation is actually not to pop a sty because it, then it can it can spread, right? Since this is an infection, it can cause a spreading and it can also cause an irritation of um, the sclera as well because that fluid will, will drip into the eye and the conjunctiva. So we don't want to create other infections if we don't have to. The treatment is typically a warm compress um, or warm washcloth. Um, 10 to 15 minutes for four times a day and then to assist with draining once you see it come to a head. Now assist with draining means when you get ready to drain it, the patient is lying in a supine position. You have some type of gauze pad to catch, right? Um, but the research suggests that there's there aren't any meds that really facilitate the healing of this. So the natural healing, allowing the body to just naturally um, treat this is the best way to go. I will say that patients who get styes are uh, most often to be repeat offenders. So in other words, they're gonna, they might suffer from styes very often. I see them most often on the lower eyelid, believe it or not. So next we have sun subconjunctival hemorrhage, which implies injury to what the conjunctiva, right? So in general, when we think about what a subconjunctival hemorrhage is, it's where we have injury or trauma to the tiny blood vessels, right, um, in the conjunctiva. So in other words, those blood vessels, remember we said, richly infiltrated in the conjunctiva. So essentially those blood vessels begin to, to break um, and so then your eye starts to look red, like kind of here. So we can see the massive amount of blood vessels that sit within the actual conjunctival layer. And so that patient, um, it can it can occur without trauma to the eye, but it certainly can occur with trauma. So with trauma, we know that it's going to be a direct blow, but indirect ways would be like coughing and or sneezing, right? Sneezing and or coughing. Um, different drugs can also cause um, sun conjunctival hemorrhages, so, such as warfarin or NSAIDs. So there won't be any pain associated with this pathology. So that is a differential historical question when you're asking a patient who comes in like this. Is it hyphema, which will be in the anterior chamber of the eye? Is it a subconjunctival hem hemorrhage? Well, there won't be any pain. Vision is typically not impacted. Why? Tell me why vision would not be impacted. Which two anatomical structures are not involved in this? Right, so the iris isn't involved and the pupil isn't involved. And so since those two aren't involved and they control the amount of light going into the eye to be processed, the vision should not be impacted by a subconjunctival hemorrhage. So we can see that it's pretty harmless for the most part, right? The pupil isn't impacted. If we look at the cornea, which is gonna cover the anterior surface of that pupil and the iris, it's clear. So the only time we really refer out is if they have changes in vision, so dipopia or double vision, um, anascoria, or if they start to have pain, because then we know that it's impacting something other than the conjunctiva. In terms of treatment, uh, because the eye does get a little dry, uh, we recommend some type of eye drop um, in there to kind of irrigate, to kind of create the moisture that you might need, that you might not be able to get um, on a regular basis. So next up, the anatomical structure that we'll talk about is the 
cornea. The cornea can really suffer from a few different types of injury. Either you can have an infection to the cornea, which is as a result secondarily most often to an abrasion to the cornea or a laceration. And then the laceration or abrasion opens the way for pathogens to enter the cornea, thereby creating a corneal infection, right? So let's talk through an abrasion. The most common way that we see a corneal abrasion happening is actually through the process of removing contact. So if you're trying to do it really quickly and you you rub the the um, cornea, then you can create what we call is an abrasion across the cornea. But it certainly could be trauma from sports. So most often we'll see corneal abrasions in um, field hockey, stick sports where there's blows to the eyes, boxing, for example. What does it feel like? Pain, they're gonna have moderate to severe. So we're talking like a seven to 10 on a pain scale. Vision is not completely absent, but might be decreased. In other words, it, they might not have a clear field of vision because the cornea, which covers both the pupil and the iris and, and creates the pathway for light to enter are going to is going to be impacted you might see a watery discharge and this is the eyes protective mechanism right my cornea is injured so i'm going to blink a lot to try to moisten it and so you're going to have more fluid being removed from the eye the pupil however will not be affected remember that cornea is the top layer it's the most superficial layer so uh, typically a corneal abrasion does not penetrate the pupil and or the the iris but the cornea itself will be cloudy um, as a result of the abrasion. And so what we can do is what we call is a fluorescein swab. And I'll show you what those look like. Essentially what you do is you put a fluorescent um, dye into the eye, turn on the fluorescent light and see if in fact, if it lights up, if in fact we actually have a corneal abrasion. On the um, So in terms of presentation, that patient's going to present with maybe double vision potentially. A watery eye, which we talked about, is a protective mechanism. They're going to feel like something's in the eye because the cornea has been scratched or a gritty feeling and they will report pain. So what do we do for them if we absolutely rule this in? We refer them to an ophthalmologist to treat with an antibiotic to reduce the risk of infection um, and some type of analgesic. One of the problems with a corneal abrasion, however, is the patient may just like kind of what's the right word blow it off because they might just feel like oh it's something in my no big deal so three four days later they come in and now they have an infection because that cornea has just been sitting there open right the big key thing for contact wearers is they cannot wear the contact um, because the cornea is scratched and so we want we don't want to put anything over it and then you want to use an eye patch when necessary and the opposite and more traumatic end of that is a corneal laceration. And I'm not sure that you can see it in this image, but right in here, hopefully you see the break in the, the tissue. And this has actually happened to a women's basketball player um, on our team. So you can see right here that corneal laceration. So um, corneal lacerations are a little bit more traumatic in nature because the cornea actually not only is a braze, but has actually been 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 cut most often it does not have to be repaired um, the only time that it really truly has to be repaired is if and when it impacts the pupil or goes down to the iris and impacts the ability of the um, iris to constrict or dilate the pupil so um, again for a corneal laceration we will do the same thing a fluorescein strip put that in there to see if the the cornea has been compromised and then a referral out to an ophthalmologist if need be to get to get treated. So there are really two types of fractures that can occur to the orbit. The first one and probably most common is called what is what is called a blowout fracture and that is where the fracture actually occurs to the uh, medial wall. Um, so the medial wall of the eye and the inferior floor of the eye. So that is what we call a blowout fracture. However, there are times where the object will hit the orbit in just the right rate and create what we call is a blow up fracture. And that would be the roof of the orbit or the superior margin of the orbit fractures. But most often what we see are blowout fractures and the name as the name implies is um, the inferior medial borders of that orbit are just completely fractured and can't create stability on the inferior aspect of that orbit, allowing the eye to move a little bit more in the protective orbit circuit. So um, you can see there the, those arrows in the image are pointing to the, air, the site of fracture. Um, so with that said, what are the signs and symptoms? So you'll have swelling, you'll have ecchymosis, um, and you'll have diplopia or double, double vision. And other signs and symptoms most often um, will be what? Tenderness to palpation in the area,
Um, what you might also get with an orbital fracture is that the globe, if it's like sunken, so if it's like medial um, displaced, or you can have an eyeball that is retracted, right? Sitting way down in the uh, eye socket. Um, so you just wanna be careful. You wanna make sure you're looking and having the patient move in, in different ways. What we also see with a blowout fracture um, is that numbness may be present in that in infra or, um, infraorbital area, particularly in that inferior area. But all of that to be said, we want to w refer out anytime we see the eye being displaced in, in a different way, or if we have that diplopia that we've, we've talked about. So the orbital socket, remember we talked about this um, for a very long time, that it's made up of seven bones and you can kind of see those bones there, right? Um, when we think about the orbital socket with blunt trauma, a lot of times you can have what is called a maxillary uh, bone fracture where that max that maxillary bone or that inferior border of the orbit um, fractures downward, right? So it fractures downward. And then most often what we see is that the, the contents hurry down into the um, underlying maxillary sinus, creating that, that blowout fracture that we talked about. One of the signs and symptoms is what we call is in, inophthalmia, which is the sunken in globe. And so what you see oftentimes with a sunken in globe where the eye may sit deeper into the socket is entrapment of the inferior rectus. So what won't the eye be able to do when you're tracking? Anybody want to tell me? Correct. If it's trapped, if the inferior rectus is trapped, when we go to look up, the patient may not be able to look upward. So that is a common sign and symptom of a blowout fracture, that sunken in globe or that anophthalmia, but then the entrapment of the inferior rectus and the inability to look upward when you ask them to do, to do that. Okay, next we have acute iritis. As the name implies, it's an inflammation of the, the iris. Um, and so you have in, this inflammatory condition uh, in the anterior chamber, particularly on the actual iris itself. Most often occurs from a result of blunt trauma, but where I've seen it in the clinical setting is going to be the, a chemical burn. So a chemical burn ignites this inflammatory response within the iris. Remember we talked about heat sources and we talked about too much light and the iris kind of working to kind of um, reduce the amount um, and the eyelids doing that as well. So most often acute iritis is going to be as a result of a chemical burn, but certainly can happen as a result of blunt force trauma. With this, uh, the patient complains of a deep, deep ache because it's, it's not gonna be superficial because you have that cornea sitting there, but you'll have pressure in the eye, this is the first time that I say pressure, you'll have a, uh, a decline in vision. And that's because what's happening, the iris, which contains the muscles and is responsible for um, allowing the pupil to dilate and constrict, right? That's going to be impacted. And so will vision because either too much light or not enough light will get in. And so you won't be able to um, truly, honestly focus the light on the retina the way that you're supposed to do that right? There is no discharge present with this particular pathology. However, the pupil may be more constricted and irregular and certainly sluggish in reacting, right? So why would that be? Because the structure that's responsible for controlling its movement is now compromised. Does that, I hope that makes sense. Okay. Um, the cornea will be clear. So we're doing that checklist. What things are compromised? The cornea will be clear. And then the other thing that we see oftentimes is um, this may be due to another type of condition such as rheumatoid arthritis, right? So what do we do for them? Um, we refer out to an ophthalmologist and hopefully they'll give us some sort of steroid because it's an inflammatory condition, eye drops that will help reduce the inflammatory um, the infl inflammatory process that is occurring and causing such a pathology within the eye. If you don't take care of this, then think it has um, went into the iris and then just deep to the iris, we know that the lens lives there, so it's going to have an impact on the lens if it's allowed to infiltrate there. Our next pathology is going to be a retinal detachment, um, most often caused by some type of jarring of the head or direct blow to the head. But it can also be very spontaneous in nature. In other words, you don't need any type of injury to the head to actually cause a retinal detachment. We think about a retinal detachment in etiology. Um, it's an eye problem where the retina 
is actually pulled away from its normal position. So you can kind of see that there where the retina is being, where the retina is being pulled away from its original position, right on the actual um, globe of the eye. And so then what, what you start to see oftentimes is that vitreous humor uh, will start to leak slowly into this, into this particular cavity, creating a little bit of a pressure but then also some of the really key signs and symptoms um, are that the patient will complain of like a lot of new floaters or small dark spots or squiggly lines that they see float across their vision. So they'll start to see floaties in their eye. They may also complain of what are called flashes of light or photo photopsia. So I'll write that here, photopsia, which is a flash of light. So like light flashes before their eye. Um, they have they have also reported a lot of times a dark shadow or a curtain on the sides or in the middle of their vision field, vision field. And this is actually a medical emergency. Um, so if you have if you have a patient who has symptoms of a detached retina, again, we're talking they are saying they have floaters, something floating across their eye. They're having flashes of light. They have a dark shadow in their vision field. And it's obviously not a migraine. Right. That's the big thing. Then you must refer them out to the um, to the ER right away and then hopefully an optometrist or an ophthalmologist will be able to um, get them treatment right away away and what that is is a retinal reattachment right the big key thing is that if you don't reattach it then the patient's at risk for long-term eye issues and maybe even becoming blinded in that one particular eye so who would be at risk for a retinal detachment um, someone who has a family member who had a retinal detachment before probably at more risk for uh, spontaneous um, if they've ever had a serious eye injury they are at more risk overall um, and then if they've had surgery to treat like cataracts or glaucoma for example they might be at a greater risk for retinal de detachments I will say for some students whose blood pressure is high right now, they're very, 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 very rare. So um, make sure you're looking for the key signs and symptoms. One, do they have floaters going across their eye, right? Do two, what would be the third sign and symptom? What did we say? Anyone remember? The flashes of light or the photopsia. And then three, maybe a dark shadow, right? That isn't associated with a migraine. Next up is a hyphema. You can kind of see this here. Um, I'm gonna circle it here. You can see that there's blood in the anterior chamber um, or segment of the eye, most often as a result of blunt force trauma and even a tear in the ciliary body. Um, but less frequently, hyphemas can occur spontaneously, but again, with no evidence of trauma, but it's just very rare. Most often there's some type of traumatic injury that occurs. The concern with this is that as the blood is allowed to accumulate in the anterior chamber, it may cover the iris in the pupil, which then would limit the ability of the eye to receive light, right? Um, and so it's usually as a result of a ruptured iris uh, root vessel um, or, and or secondary to trauma, right? So either you have some rupturing of the iris from a traumatic blow or you just have blood feeling the actual anterior chamber because of the traumatic um the traumatic blow so what do we do refer out what are the signs and symptoms you see them there's actually blood in the anterior chamber we're going to put an eye shield on this eye and the reason we're going to do that is so that the eye doesn't move right so we we usually will cover the eye um, to protect them during transport and then essentially what what they want to do is relieve the the pressure um, and that can it can just resolve itself and then oftentimes it may mean that you actually have to drain it tech which can be pretty painful the reality is if we don't clear this right if we don't if we don't clear this out of the eye then the concern is what whether or not the patient will, will be blind permanently I mean, foreign bodies in the eye, for the most part, are very, um, can be troublesome, but the nice thing is they're very benign. In other words, they're not going to be as traumatic as a hyphema or an orbital blowout fracture or blow up fracture, right? The key thing, the thing that you're going to want to do is you're actually going to want to remove it. But if we allow our eyes to do what we nor what they normally do, if they blink every five seconds, if they secrete oil and water and they lubricate the eye and the lacrimal gland causes us to cry, then we know that, that typically that foreign body can be removed. Now by foreign body, I mean something very small. 
What you don't want to do is try to pick at the eye and remove it or use tweezers. I've seen both of those being done in the clinical setting. What you want to do is and when I say copiously, I mean irrigate that eye with clean, warm water to remove the object and relieve symptoms. Remember, um, you want to drain down, so you don't want to drain into the other eye. And then just reassure the patient calmly. So depending on how large the foreign body is, you can see these are large foreign bodies, depending on how large the foreign body is, it can really cause the patient to panic. So what you really truly want to do is just irrigate as much as you can, use something under pressure, water pressure, and then typically that foreign body will be removed, right? On occasion, your foreign body can cause either a corneal um, or a scleral kind of laceration. So um, in those instances, what we want to do is then refer that patient out if they're reporting other signs and symptoms associated with corneal, corneal or scleral issues. But for the most part, they're pretty, pretty harmless. Um, I say apply loose bandage and cover object if small, um, a paper cup may work. So example, if you can't get the object out, right? If you've irrigated and you can't get it out, you want to do is cover that eye and then you want to refer it out and let the ER do the irrigation work. So refer, refer, refer. If you suspect a lacerated uh, cornea um, or a braised cornea after treatment, again, refer so that patient can get treated the way that they need to get treated. But it's not a medical emergency. I think that's what I am trying to say. Here are other examples of foreign bodies in the eye. So that's huge, right? So what we can do with them is refer out, may not be able to get everything out. You can see that this foreign body is actually doing what? It's impacting the actual pupil itself. So again, that's a referral out. But this is a beautiful image of the muscles of the iris. Okay, so how do we manage a traumatic eye injury, right? Um, the biggest way to manage a traumatic eye injury, such as a hyphema, um, a foreign body in the eye that we can't remove, the list could go on, iritis, um, is we want to cover that eye to protect it. Once the eye is covered, it won't want to move much, but we know that the eyes are a uh, pair, and so they move in units, and so sometimes we have to cover both eyes to prevent tracking if, if that is warranted. An example of that might actually be um, with a blowout or blow-up fracture where you don't want them to move the eye too much. So, Let's name the pathology. What is this? I'll ask it in class. Okay, so what are signs and symptoms of optic nerve damage? We talked about retinal detachment. We talked about the inability to relay impulses to the optic nerve. But what are signs and symptoms of optic nerve damage? And then really kind of last but not least is optic nerve damage. This would be like extreme, right? Uh, most often can be associated with any of the injuries that we talked about, but what are some of the signs and symptoms? So blurred vision would be one. So we're not really focusing the, uh, the image or the light on the retina the way that it's supposed to be uh, focused. And so as a result, it becomes unfocused, it becomes blurred. You can have um, abnormal peripheral vision, which would be compromised to the cones or the rods, which ones? Good, if you said rods, you'd be correct, right? That's most responsible with that peripheral vision. Your cones are gonna be C, central vision, color. You can have interpretation problems. So in other words, what we see in front of us is not what the brain's actually interpreting. And so that can be a concern that means that those electrical impulses aren't being um, carried to the brain the way that they're supposed to. You can have decreased constriction of the pupil. So pupils equal and reactive and responsive to light. Um, that's mostly controlled by the oculomotor nerve, but the optic nerve does play a role in that as well. You can have photophobia, right? What is photophobia? What did we say that was? Does anybody remember what we said photophobia was? Great, that kind of sensitivity to light, right? So in other words, things are, it feels like an overexposure to light, things appear to be brighter than they actually are and so you're more sensitive and you can't really handle that so those all would be signs and symptoms of optic nerve damage and would warrant referral to an ophthalmologist most certainly so how do we differentially diagnose for eyesight loss right damage to one optic nerve right so your right or left versus left damage to the optic chiasma remember that's the most central portion of that and then damage closer to the brain. Like how do we determine what is what based on what is compromised anatomically? How would we do that? 
let's talk about it. If it's damage to one optic nerve, then we know, so one optic nerve, then we know that it's the sight loss is only gonna occur in one eye, right? That makes sense to us, that's intuitive. So it's gonna occur, occur typically before the, the optic chiasma, right? So we have injury to one of the optic nerves, only one of the eyes is impacted. If you have damage at the optic chiasma, however, then most often that's where the two nerves are meeting. It's where they're converse, converting. So you'll have impact to both eyes. And most often that impact is to the peripheral vision, the, out, the outward vision, right? So they'll be able to see straight ahead, but they won't be able to see on the side, which is why it's important to do that, drop that star pattern. And then um, damage closer to the brain, right so we're thinking more down here um and so then part of the visual field will be lost in in both eyes so not just um, peripheral vision but most of their vision will be lost on both sides so that is differential diagnosis is it one eye impacted that's the optical the optic nerve is it both eyes impacted and they can't see on the sides that's optic chiasma if it's brain injury then their entire visual field may be impacted by that so all that to say, this is the end. I hope you learned something about the eye.